I'm going to start off the show by doing what I did on a Thursday. Thursday's episode of Tumblr East is by looking through my old archive of Tumblr screenshots when I first started Tumblr East as the page. <laughs> and here we have a screenshot of somebody saying, uh, searching for coming out as a brony. And in response, okay, look here, you pieces of shit. Coming out is one of, if not the most nerve-wracking experiences in any LGBT person's life. And comparing something as self-defining as being LGBT is nothing like awkwardly telling your family you like to beat your autistic junk to scootaloo. Jesus fucking Christ, I hate everyone. Brony and gay fighting, which I would consider it infighting, but we'll move on. This world is unfair. Why can't straight guys I fall for turn gay? Is that too much to ask for? Yes. Uh, FML. So I, oh, this is from a, a, a brony. Uh, somebody called the realist pony. FML. So I tried anal for the first time. I'm bi. And now I've, now I'm walking funny and my ass is bleeding. But on top of it all, I have to fart. Very healthy, healthy expressions of love. Make love to me in my ass. Grinder is shit. I wonder how many more hookups in the world would happen if Grinder worked all of the time. Is it really that hard? You know, God is giving you a chance. Repent. Your device of choice by which to obtain sex is not working. Maybe that's a sign you should stop, but no. Why do straight boys have to look so cute? It's causing me physical pain, I swear. Oh, they have no interest in converting you. No, not at all. Some guy just offered me $400 to suck my dick. What is going on? Hashtag grinder. Awkward, curious guys on grinder trying to get with a man for the first time. And... That moment when you realize when the director told you you should practice having something in your ass before getting fucked for the first time. He said it for a good reason. Nothing hotter than a guy who is in pain from being butt fucked. I have no idea how to talk to straight boys. No, 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 no. I'm not doing this. Nope, no, nope. I'm not about to start crushing on another straight boy. No. Hashtag gay teen. Hashtag why me. Hashtag why do you hate me. I've never actually, I've actually never had my ass properly eaten before. Hashtag need, need. Crushing on straight boys is the worst. Oh wait, there's more. Seriously, why? I've seen so many straight good looking guys with some of the biggest roundest asses I've ever seen. And I'm like, why can't you like guys too? I would make you love the dick or at least me, but why? My twin brother likes the same girl as me. Hashtag, she's by two, though. Some proud parents, I, I bet. You know what? They probably are proud, given the quality of... Never mind. Mission complete. It has been six days, and today I got my bottom needs filled and full. Love being a cum dump full of warm cum on my ass. You are not disgusting. You are totally not worthy of of being judged because you're such a great person. There should be a support group for bottoms with irritable bowel syndrome. I am not making any of this up. This is what is out there. Well, as of November 2013, and things have gotten a hell of a lot worse since then. I got literally pounded twice last night, and now it hurts to poop. Being a bottom is so much work when you're not having sex, like having to shave and making sure you're clean and whatnot, and not being able to eat when you think you're going to have sex later. It sucks. A lot. Hashtag gay boy problems. If you think there isn't any more of this, you are wrong. I'm so hungry, but I'm probably bottoming later. Fuck. Bottoms, help me. Oh, I already included that one in the previous episode. Yeah, this is what I did. I did something different on a Thursday where I just scrolled through it, recorded myself, and I didn't have a script for anything. <sighs> Gay Jew stuff. Literal Jews. Top privilege is letting the bottom do all the goddamn work and then complaining when our jaws or thighs need a goddamn break. 
I swear to God, tops are among the whiniest insecure brats I've ever encountered. Normal. The new normal. So, why am I reading these posts by these perverts from screenshots that I took some time ago? Well, this article comes from the New York Post, and this was on the front page of Drudge Report um, a couple of days ago as of this recording. Maybe it's still there, I don't know. And the article is called, A Massive Silent Cultural Revolution Has Changed America by Kyle Smith. It happened without a summer of love, without Timothy Leary, without a groovy anthem, or a shaggy new national look. In the past decade or so, there's been a silent revolution in American culture, one at least as profound as the 60s upheavals. We've hardly taken notice of it because it happened in people's minds instead of in the streets. It happened in ordinary people instead of in the elites and the punditocracy. A odd that I see a sentiment that I've expressed many times on this show being repeated in a mainstream publication. Continuing, we don't want to judge others for anything, even if what they're doing is destructive. Compared to just a few years ago, we have a completely different set of ideas about what constitutes acceptable behavior. And here we go. As Caitlyn Jenner puts it in her new reality show, I'm the new normal. Consider America circa 2002. Not that different from today, seemingly. A time traveler who spent a few hours walking around your town then and now might have a difficult time filling a small notebook with observations about what's changed. Maybe there are more Starbucks. And what happened to Blockbuster Video? Yet support for gay marriages to be treated the same as straight ones went from 39% just nine years ago to 60% today, according to Gallup. As recently as 2010, a clear majority opposed gay marriage. Today, a large majority support it. As for the broader issue of whether gay and lesbian relationships are even morally acceptable, only 40% said yes in 2001. Today, that number stands at 63%. In other words, more Americans are okay with homosexuality than were okay with divorce in 2001. Divorce was at 59%. Uh, approval in 2001. A decade ago, a plurality of Americans did not even believe that homosexuality is innate. Today, by a margin of 51 to 30 percent, Americans think if you're gay, you were born that way. What causes all these changes? It's hard to say. Older Americans are dying off. Popular culture not only deals with homosexuality approvingly, but has added more and more gay personalities to the mix. In 2002, The Ellen DeGeneres Show had not yet debuted. As my colleague Sarah Stewart noted, today she's our cultural's, culture's lovable gay grandma. Kill me. Are we more attuned to pop culture than we used to be? Maybe. In the 60s and 70s, marijuana usage became a hugely popular theme in entertainment. Public opinion, though, did not follow. In 1969, the year of Easy Rider, support for legal pot stood at 12%. As recently as 2003, it was still only 34%. But in the last two Gallup polls on the subject, 2013 and 2014, support in an outright majority for the first time. And yet only 7% told Gallup in 2013 that they themselves currently take marijuana. Americans are simply broadly more tolerant of others who are unlike them. As a general trend, that's heartening. On the other hand, what comes along with this mass departure of moral judgment from public life? Let's say we grant that it's morally acceptable to smoke weed. Is it morally acceptable then to spark up a joint every day at lunch? Sure, as long as you're not endangering others, it's still not terribly wise, though. This author's a moron, but we'll keep going. If your unemployment, unemployed roommate drifts through life perpetually stoned, you may resist telling him what he's doing is morally wrong, but it is, in some sense, not okay. Again, this author is a moron for, without a trace of irony, typing the words, not okay. That's not okay. How about it's stupid, it's wrong, it's fucking dumb. But no, it's just, it's just not okay. Does being a good and tolerant citizen mean you should shrug when a person chooses to spend his life wasted? Or spend, spend your life... Uh, never mind. Let's scroll back a few minutes. Listen to the screenshots I was reading off of. Yeah, but it's okay to spend your life doing that. 
Increasingly, we don't want to judge others for anything, even if what they're doing is destructive. But is being non-judgmental the same as granting tacit approval, even support? Consider the amazing turnaround in people's views of single parenthood. As of 2002, only 45% of Americans thought it was morally acceptable to have a child outside of wedlock. Today, it's 61%. And yet, concurrent with that shift in opinion, it's become obvious that whether or not it's morally wrong to have a kid without being married, it's undoubtedly bad for that kid. <laughs> to consider just one of many alarming statistics, if you're a child growing up in what was once called a broken home, you're six or seven times as likely to witness domestic violence as those brought up by married parents. Perhaps it's bad, judgmental, even morally wrong to mention that. For all of the disgust for moralizing, we have more micro-moralizing than ever. Raising a child without a spouse is absolutely fine, but devise an awkwardly worded joke or muse about the comportment of the president's daughters, and you might have, you might find yourself denounced from coast to coast, even if you were not previously considered a public figure. If you're a baker, you can refuse to cater a gay wedding for any reason you please. You're too busy, you're taking a few days off, you're hungover, but if you say the words, I don't approve of gay marriage, you'll not only be vilified, you'll be bankrupted. Let's hope that 15 years from now, another cultural revolution has followed, and Americans will be able to think whatever they want without fear of condemnation. Like I've said many times on this show, the elites are going to do what the elites are going to do. It's our neighbors we have to worry about. It's what they do. That's what we have to worry about. Because they vote. They spend money. They have children. So the author of this article says that if you are being raised in a single parent household, you're more likely to see domestic violence, which is true. It should be really called single motherhood because you rarely see single fathers. And if you do, it's usually because the, the mother of the children died. Or she's just so completely fucked up that, you know, the, the judge had no choice but to award custody to the, to the father, which really says a lot about the woman if she's that fucked up. So, if the Gallup polls are be, to be believed, which they've been caught manipulating, but I do think that the majority of people are stupid and have terrible opinions and we suffer the consequences of that. So we'll go with this. This is what 61% of people believe is morally right. This comes from blackandright.com, and I'll link to it below because there's some dashes in the URL there. With the subdued public release of the error-riddled documentary The Hunting Ground, Title IX activists, opportunistic politicians, and the lockstep media repeated the assertion that college campuses are places where testosterone-raged young men prey on poor, unsuspecting young women. There's no such thing as testosterone in the college environment, but whatever, that's not the point. Continuing, however, especially when it comes to progressives, there's usually a side of the story not headlined because it would poke a huge hole in their cause. And this quotes an article, a news story. A former Virginia Tech student has been sentenced to 45 years in prison for the 2014 murder of another female student who she brutally strangled after the victim wrote their lesbian fling off as an experiment. 45 years and not life in prison. This is not an isolated freak incident, and women aren't always these frail bambies unexpectedly pounced upon and torn apart by vicious male wolves. And here is something that I have cited many times in the um, last several weeks. Statistics have shown that lesbian people experience domestic violence at a very similar rate to that of heterosexual women. It has been estimated that between 17% to 45% of lesbians have been the victim of at least one act of violence perpetrated by a female partner, and that 30% of lesbians have reported sexual assault or rape by another woman. Taking the percentage fluctuation into account, those numbers are much higher than the embellished 1 in 5 stat tossed around by Title IX exploiters, and the federal government has even taken notice. Many incidents of intimate partner violence include some form of sexual assault. According to the 2010 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, bisexual women experienced significantly higher lifetime prevalence of rape 
and other sexual violence by an intimate partner when compared to heterosexual women, and significantly higher lifetime prevalence of rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner when compared to a lesbian and heterosexual women. St some studies indicate that between 20 and 35 percent of LGBTQ couples experience domestic violence. Of course, this is not to diminish actual sexual assault incidents when they happen, but it's also clear that gay domestic violence appears to not only be at a higher rate than that of the male-on-female campus rape culture epidemic, but it's consciously underreported by activists and their media because victimization is a big money business and something as irrelevant as LGBTQ intimate partner violence will not be allowed to turn off that cash and sympathy spigot. This is our first public discussion, a discussion that we agreed is necessary to illustrate the pervasive nature of the culture of rape and the need for the entire LGBTQ community to be allies to all survivors. Nowhere in that advocacy Huffington Post piece is the issue of LGBTQ domestic violence even inferred. We expect lies and deception from the activist left. Be prepared to be called on it. But don't judge. Don't judge these people for beating the shit out of each other. Don't judge them for posting about how they want to convert straight boys. Don't judge them for anything, because judging is the worst thing you could possibly do, according to your average American. So, let's explore some other behavior that we shouldn't judge. And this one comes from StarTribune.com. Parents call on school's chief to resign after smitten kitten field trip. Parents of students at a small Minneapolis private school are demanding the director resign after she led a field trip to a shop that sells sex toys and adult novelties. We are not happy with what happened, said, said Steve Strawmat, who has already removed his 10-year-old son from the school. Strawmat issued a statement on behalf of about nine sets of parents of kids at, wait for it, Gaia Democratic School. Gaia Democratic School. Mother Gaia, Earth is a living organism. You stupid liberal fucks. You deserve every corruption your child gets. You fucking fucks. This is why the Midwest is no place for <laughs> the, uh, the white man to have his homeland, because these are the people that make it up. Okay. Nine sets of parents of kids at Gaia Democratic School are outraged that director... Starry Hedges took about a dozen middle and high school age students to the Smitten Kitten last week as a part of a sex education course. Oh, I don't have any problem with sex education, but don't take my children to a, uh, a sex toy shop. I'd much rather have them, you know, have that, in that information be introduced by their Boy Scout leader. Oh, he's so tolerant and great. <sighs> Meanwhile, parent Lynn Floyd filed a complaint with Minneapolis police accusing Hedges of exposing children to pornographic material. The police report recommends further investigation. I want her done and out and that school closed, Floyd said. Thursday. I don't know when this was written. It was written sometime this week, I assume, because I also found this under a report. She also said, I want her away from children, uh, he continued. It's borderline predation. Hedges did not return calls seeking comment, but the school posted a statement on its website defending its leader. Gaia Democratic School's board of directors stands behind the premise of the field trip, the statement said. We view it as a legitimate learning experience that relates directly to topics covered during our year-long sexual health class. How to be sexually healthy. Shove rubber 12-inch dongs up your ass. Straw Matt and other parents say they are angered that Hedges took students to the shop without notification or approval and then defended the field trip in public. The statement says her actions in defense of the field trip demonstrate extremely poor judgment and dereliction of responsibility. Floyd said that all the Gaia parents should pull their children out of the school. Every sane individual I've spoken to about this, they're struggling to wrap their minds around it, he said. Even though you yourself, you fuck, are not sane for sending your child to a school called Gaia Democratic School. I couldn't imagine this. If I put every amount of, every brain cell I had towards imagining some shit like this, I could not possibly make something like this up. And I'm sad that I couldn't because 
Reality is beating me in the realm of imagination. Guy rents space in a Unitarian church on Mount Curve Avenue. Unitarian church. Big fucking shock. The school has between 25 and 45 K to 12 students and an annual budget of about $105,000, according to IRS records. The school has a motto promising academic freedom, youth empowerment, and democratic education. <sighs> yeah, because young people should be empowered and encouraged to pursue whatever retarded whims they have. School board members said in their statement that the ongoing discussions in the sex education class prepared students for their visit to the smitten kitten. School officials said students were not required to attend the field trip. Along with selling sex toys, condoms, leather products, and DVDs, the store offers workshops similar to the ones the students took part in. During the field trip, some students purchased condoms, parents said. Straw Matt's son did not intend the field trip, but he said the fact that they made the trip and without parental notification shows poor judgment. You show poor you show you show poor judgment, you stupid fuck. The school would not be open if it were for stupid fucks like you. That's why I don't view parenthood as unequivocally good. Ronald Reagan's kid is a big fuckwad. If we're going to use a mainstream example. Ronald Reagan did more harm than good. Look at his genetic legacy. A tremendous piece of shit. And that's what most people's genetic legacy is. Parents from nine families met Thursday night, intensifying their criticism after the statement by the board defending Hedges. It was the second such meeting in less than a week. We do not believe the Gaia Democratic School can continue, nor should continue, under Miss Hedges' leadership and strongly urge them to find a replacement, the statement read. Because Gaia is a private school, the Minnesota Department of Education has no authority in the matter. Well, if they were taking them to, I don't know, the Adolf Hitler Museum, I'm sure the Minnesota Department of Education would intervene. They would find some excuse, some obscure law somewhere in the books to, you know, use that as an excuse to intervene because you can't teach kids Holocaust denial, but you can take them to a sex shop. After the field trip, Cement and Kitten was cited by Minneapolis city inspectors. Inspectors found that the store had sexually explicit materials within view of minors and did not isolate the materials in a separate section of the shop. What? Okay. This is a sex shop. It shouldn't be open in the first place. And if it is open, it should be subject to, uh, you know, they should be taxed 99% of whatever they make. <sighs> wow, oh, you, you sex shop had things that were in view of minors. <laughs> and that's what we're getting in trouble for. The store was ordered to fix the problems, but no fines or other penalties were issued. So nothing really happened to them. Smitten Kitten's owner, Jennifer Pritchett, a woman, go figure, said in an email Monday that she considers Smitten Kitten to be an educational resource about sex and sexuality. We leave it up to the discretion of parents and guardians as to when, if, and in what capacity they seek resources from our educators. Professional smut merchants are educators now. And if you think that's the only story I have regarding teachers and education and how we shouldn't judge them because, you know... It's a very important position. Teaching is a very important profession. You know, these merchants of cultural genocide. Yeah, they're very important to society because um, everyone needs to know how to use a dildo. Everyone needs to know what kinds of dildos there are because, you know, you, you can't live a functional life if you don't know how to use sex toys. Or read and analyze erotica. So, here's another story from LATimes.com. Bay Area teacher reportedly asks students to snap selfies with parents' sex toys. A Bay Area teacher is in hot water for a risque homework assignment. Risque homework assignment. I mixed up the uh, emphases there. Emphases. Whatever. Reportedly asking students to take selfies with their parents' sex toys. The teacher's extra credit assignment requested that Ensenal High School students scour through their parents' dresser drawers in search of condoms, sex toys, or anything provocative and snap a selfie of themselves, according to KPIX-TV. 
It's unclear whether any students actually turned in the assignment or what the teacher may have done with the assignment. <laughs> it's also unknown which classes was an assignment for and why. When high school officials heard about the teacher's homework assignment, they, contact, they contacted the administrators with the Alameda Unified School District, who launched an investigation into the allegations, District Spokeswoman Susan Davis said. The teacher's grade books were examined, and parents and students were interviewed, she said. Because of the allegations, the, teachers, the teacher was placed on leave. We take, we take reports like this seriously, Davis said. We know that it's hard for the public, and especially for parents, to hear that we can't talk about the details of the investigation in public. But that information has to be kept confidential, both to protect the rights of all involved and to preserve the integrity of the investigation. Despite the ongoing investigation, parents are demanding the teacher be fired. District officials expect to wrap up their investigation next week, but by then... School will be over for the year. We know that people have a lot of questions, Davis said. We have questions too and are doing our best to get the tr to the truth in this matter. Fuck you, everyone. Fuck you, teachers. Fuck you, school districts. Fuck you, taxpayers. Fuck you, what what percentage is that? Let me, let me look that up. Fuck you, 60% of Americans. Come obsessed pieces of shit, all of you. And fuck you too, the other 40%. Fuck me, because I don't do anything. You don't do anything. We're guilty. I'm guilty. Going back to the smitten kitten story, Mr. Steve Strawmat, we're not happy with what happened. I'm not happy with what you've made happen. You having a child for no good reason, most likely, and then sending your child to a fucking school called Gaia Democratic School where youth learn to be empowered and the education is democratic, whatever the fuck that means. But I'm the evil one for judging you. I'm not the evil one because I didn't have a child that I had no reason to have, and I didn't send that child to a fucking school called Gaia Democratic School. I'm the evil one. Even though I produced no evil, you have. 60%. 60%. And growing. But it's me who's the bad guy. But, like I said, what have I done? I have not done a whole lot. But that is naive of me to think that the course of things can be changed through action. Realistically, nothing can be changed as a result of my input, because I am one person. I am one body, one mind. I can organize all the facts, present them, interpret them, tell you why certain things are wrong, certain things are right, but I said a long time ago, people aren't really influenced by the facts. They are influenced by comfort, what makes them happy. And in my experience... Everlasting happiness, or enduring happiness, any extended period of happiness I've ever had is usually followed by some of the worst times of my life. And let's face it, what pe most people consider happiness is just a form of decadence and self-indulgence. But that's where people want to be. And they will interpret anything that is objectively negative as something positive, like single motherhood. 60% of people, single mother, it's okay. Ignore all of the behavioral issues that children have who grew up in single mother households. They ignore it because they don't want to rock the boat in their social circle. Because losing the friendship of a tattooed, facial piercing, blue-haired woman who has bastard children. That's just, that's something nobody should ever go through. So fucking pathetic. 60% put their faith in lesbianism and single motherhood. Their source of happiness, because they feel good supporting these things. They feel good supporting these things because they don't bother taking a look underneath. 
This is why I cannot have any respect for people who view innocence where there is none to be had. I'm really starting to understand why people retreat into anime. Not that I'm going to do it myself, but I understand. It's an escape. 60% of people don't retreat into having Moe slice of life waifus. It's just not the case. I think there are far more contemptible creatures worthy of my judgment. And worthy of God's judgment, if, you know... God hadn't given us the middle finger and said, fuck you guys, you're out of chances. Here's your secularism. Here's your secular world. So now I look at my emails. YouTube partnership invitation. YouTube partnership invitation. I have three within the last five days from these parasites. I talk shit about these companies, which is proof that they don't actually listen to what I do. They don't watch what I do. It's like, do these people really think they're going to get rich off of my $80 of ad revenue I make a month? I suppose if they get a couple of thousands of these schlubs who want to be YouTube stars, then I, I guess I'll make money, but I'm really curious to know now how much these YouTube partnership companies make a year, how many employees they have. And it's not like any of these emails are personalized that they send me. It's really dumb. Okay, real email time. Sent from anonymous. Keep me anonymous. Okay. My friend has a sister who will remain unnamed. She's 18 and we all hang out together. When her brother comes over, she does as well. Eventually, she started talking to my dad and they became friends as well. Not even a week later did it develop into something more. Kill me. Kill me. What the fuck? Fine by me. I don't like her and it's my dad. I could care less. Because our living situation right now, nobody has a room and we all just live in the living room. So when the time arrives, my brother and my friends are exiled to the shed. Last night, they didn't do anything, so I was hanging out with them and they fell asleep on my couch that I would usually sleep on. So woken at 6 in the morning to hear and see them having sex, not even a foot away from my sleeping body. I just sat there and let it happen. What do I do? Well, if this email doesn't perfectly fit the namesake of this channel. I've been getting a lot of these sort of advice questions over the last few weeks, and I appreciate that you're seeking me to give you guidance, but... This is why I am i don't like people very much. Because I don't like putting up with their various social retardations. And your dad, calling him a retard is an insult to the actually legitimately disabled. But as I was saying, I have no advice. I don't, I wouldn't know what the fuck to do in this situation. And I'm, I'm sorry that I have to say that. I, you, I don't have to tell you that your dad is a member of the 60% whose priority in life is cum. There are a lot of pieces of advice I could give, but none of it would be... None of it would lead you to any place that you'd probably want to be. Because I don't want to get you or anyone you know in trouble or put in jail. But I imagine that experience was incredibly traumatizing and I'm, I'm really sorry it happened to you. Okay, next up from Anonymous. I'm a 19-year-old woman who is Mormon. As you're probably aware, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is among the most conservative traditional religions and subcultures in the world. I am a strong believer in the Church, but what I want to focus on in this email is the values that this Church and many other Christian religions promote and how they translate to the followers of these religions. Over the years, I have kept the values and standards that the Church recommends. Just to give you an idea, the intangible values include personal integrity, virtue choice, and accountability, knowledge, modesty, love, and all traditional family values. 
These standards are common Christian standards. I have never tried any type of drugs or alcohol. I have never had any sexual relationships, nor do I plan to until I am married. I don't keep these standards because my religion tells me to. My keeping of these standards is embedded into my personality and personal philosophy. Through experiences I have had during my freshman year of college, I have come to realize that my views are more right-winged than I had ever anticipated due to both of my parents being very liberal. Though, as a side note, I was raised by my grandparents who are Mormon and conservative. After much self-reflection, I came to understand that my main priorities in life revolve around family, faith, and loyalty. Here's what I want to ask about. I live in Utah, big surprise, and it has a high population of Mormons. It sounds like I would be comfortable and happy with the company that I am in, however, I am not. The culture that surrounds the Mormon religion in Utah is very difficult for me, particularly the part of the culture that is specifically aimed at my age range, meaning young adults. I would say ages 18 to 25 because in Mormon culture, if you're not married by your early to mid-20s, then people start to assume that there's something wrong with you. Essentially, the focus for the age group is serious dating and getting married. This is understandable considering the emphasis on traditional values. My problem is that the men my age, note that the women are not excluded from this problem, don't value or keep the standards like the church intends them to. Maybe I have an advantage because my personality naturally complies with these conservative and traditional priorities, but it's very discouraging for me as someone who would like to date. My question arises from this. As supposedly one of the most conservative traditional institutions in the world is becoming a commonplace for people who lack a sense of loyalty to these conservative traditional morals, then what hope is there in finding someone who does feel loyalty to these things in current and future generations? When I say loyalty, I don't just mean a man who marries a woman, has children, and goes to church every Sunday. I mean someone who has real character and possesses qualities that reflect human decency. I have lived my life the way that I would want my significant other to live in terms of moral standards and lifestyles. By that, I mean a healthy and productive lifestyle. But I have yet to meet someone of the opposite sex who personifies this same disposition. The only other person I know who shares these same thoughts and actually embodies them is my best friend of 10 years, who is another female. We are both self-assured in our beliefs and our efforts to practice what we preach is evident in our lifestyle. In this sense, we are more masculine, for back, lack of a better term, that will highlight what I am trying to say, than a lot of the men in our culture because we put our beliefs into action. The men that I see may be worthy in the church, but in reality they do the bare minimum and treat what they claim are their convictions very casually. The church also promotes the idea of non-judgment. I don't want to judge others unnecessarily, and I am not Looking for someone who is perfect, no one is perfect, and I don't consider myself perfect either. What I'm looking for is someone with some backbone who respects and embraces the religion and the accompanying morals with a passion rather than treating it as an impotent factor in their decision making. This goes for anyone with any sense of morality, really. I don't want to be married to someone simply because we're both Mormon. There has to be a common ground of values, and I don't take that aspect of a relationship lightly, mainly because this person will be the father of my future offspring. I don't want to be in a relationship with someone for a significant portion of my life who has no sense of loyalty to, first and foremost, their own beliefs. If someone cannot be loyal to themselves, then there is no hope for them to be loyal to me. I don't want to be stuck in a marriage where there is no love or genuine interest in each other. We don't need to have the exact same secular interests, but obviously there needs to be compatibility. I would not expect anything from my partner that I would not first expect of myself because this is very important to me. I know that I am young, but I still have a fear that this idea of staying true to my standards is lost, not only in society as a whole, but also within my church. I am curious as to what your opinion on this is, or if you have any advice to offer, I would be appreciative of that as well. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the thoughtful email and the fact that there are women like you that exist will will serve as an encouragement to a lot of people that listen to this show. I've met a lot of Mormon people and a lot of Mormon families in my life, and I've never had anything close to a negative opinion with regard to my experiences with them, but I don't know too much about the culture because I was not brought up in it myself. But it's not terribly surprising to hear that 
the Mormon community, um, at least your your area, your segment of it, has seen the same sort of moral spiritual decline that virtually every other area of public life has seen, and private life as well, all areas of life. So it's sad to hear that people in your age group um, aren't adhering to what they ought to be adhering to. But the biggest thing to take away here is, you said it yourself, you're very young. And even though the Mormon community encourages um, young marriage, marriage at a young age, and sort of looks at you as some sort of pariah if you don't get married at a certain point, Despite this, with some exceptions, I think it's very rare and, you know, it's not very reasonable to expect a 19-year-old to get married, let alone find the right person to marry at this stage of the game. And I'll go back to the um, the main question that you asked in your email. I'll read it again for, for everyone else. If supposedly one of the most conservative traditional institutions in the world is becoming a commonplace for people who lack a sense of loyalty to these conservative traditional morals, then what hope is there in finding someone who does feel loyalty to these things in current and future generations? Um, the people who adhere to traditional ideas and behaviors and ways of being, they are becoming increasingly rare. But I look at it like this. If, if these perverts who live pretty much everywhere can find these groups of people dedicated to pursuing these very sick and obscure fetishes, they're able to find a relatively large group of people to engage in that behavior. Basically, these people are looking for something very specific, and they are finding it. Maybe took them some time, and, you know, now they're in it, and it's horrible, but... Despite the fact that the general population is becoming increasingly permissive towards this kind of behavior, there are still more people out there that want to live a life how you want to live your life. It's just a matter of knowing where to find it. And having an idea and having certain cues that you see in people that indicate to you, yes, that person is almost completely in line with what I want or completely in line with what I want and they will be marriage material. And how you find these men that value faith, family, and loyalty above all else, you have to talk to people. You have to get to know people. And it's not like you can read it in a book like these are the kinds of people that value these things. This is what you're going to see in them. This is how you're going to know. You have to, you have to rely on your own intuition for that in finding these kinds of men. If women like you exist somewhere, and they are in decreasing numbers, they are a very rare thing, women who are similar to you, then I'm sure that there are men similar to what you're looking for out there. It's just a matter of being able to develop your sense of character, being a good judge of character. I know you say that the the church preaches non-judgment and, you know, that's that's not much different than everywhere else, as, as we have <laughs> covered on this show earlier. But you can't be afraid to judge, especially when it comes to things that you value the most. And you want children. You want a husband. And having those things requires an, a, a pretty good sense of judgment. So don't be afraid to judge. Do not be afraid to judge people's character. Because it is absolutely essential in what you're after. And figure out what you need to look for, what traits in words and in actions men have that indicate to you that they value what you value. And this is sort of a secondary thing that doesn't really have to do with your situation in particular. It's just something that it reminds me of something that I would like to talk about because um, I look at my demographics, um, the amount of views that I get in with respect to where I am getting my views in, in America and, and around the world. But mostly I'm focused on America because I am most familiar with American culture. And I do not get a lot of views from the Mormon belt, like Utah and Idaho, which would indicate to me that the cultural rot hasn't completely set in there quite yet. And this could be a function of these locations just having a, a lower population, but you know, that has something to do with it, but I do think that 
people who live in California, Florida, New York, places with high populations, high immigrant populations, you know, very urbanized settings. People like that are more familiar with the perils of urban life and the uh, drawbacks of the transactional nature of urban life and how these places have become cesspools of all sorts of degeneracy, deviancy, whatever. And women who are drawn to these environments, they tend to be of significantly lesser quality. And women sort of serve as a civilizational bellwether, a canary in the coal mine. So men in places like Utah, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, you know, these lower population places, they don't treat the idea of getting married, having children with urgency when they find a good woman. They just think, well, there, there are plenty of fish in the sea, which, you know, there might be, but you know, again, it's an increasing rarity. So um, just something I've been thinking about with regards to my audience. But again, thank you for the question. Next up from Hank the Tank. Been keeping up with the podcasts, and per usual, it's a good listen for a slow work day. Ran into a situation where I found myself bringing up traditional masculinity with some gym-going friends of mine while we were at the gym, which was strange as we never talk politics when lifting. It seems that modern masculinity falls under the oversimplified alpha-slash-beta paradigm of the alphas get laid, the beta does not as opposed to responsibility, loyalty, and taking accountability for the decisions and actions you make. I argued that women and people at large lack foresight, and for all intents and purposes, won't run into any immediate issues due to their promiscuity. They can simply spread their legs in their late teens, early 20s, and have men give them the D they think they crave or need, and in their 30s they become either bitter and contribute to more feminist causes, or attempt to settle down with their looks fading and lack of any real relationship skills, as you don't learn jack shit from a string of one-night stands or short-term relationships. I'm afraid this is where that new axiom of 30 is the new 20 is coming from. I agree. The crux of my argument was this. We as men are partly to blame, and while this does not absolve the women of responsibility, it does add to the growing problem of hedonism and selfishness, selfishness which in turn leads to the decay of the fam familial unit. It's like leaving a big juicy steak on the floor with a dog in the room and being surprised that the dog ate it. Now, I don't think it's fair to compare women to dogs as dogs are far more loyal. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> if you live a hedonistic life. By the way, the, the last email I answered in this one, I did not put them together on purpose. This was completely coincidental. Anyway, and lack... Okay, what does it say? Okay, if you live a hedonistic life and lack traditional values... You will give impressionable women no reason to change their attitudes as women in general tend to hold on to social values that reflect the times. I mean, everybody does, but women tend to be increasingly sensitive to it. Their responses generally range from who cares, hashtag yellow, or who cares, why try to fix anything. It's like pissing in an ocean of piss. Enjoy the ride, brah. While the second statement holds some truth, I'm starting to believe our social values are akin to Kitty Genevieve. Genevieve? Genovese? I don't know. I'm, I don't know how to pronounce that name, I apologize. And while it's being butchered, all we can do is look on and think somebody else will take care of it. I apologize for the wall of words, but my main question is this. Are these men helping the situation at all? I do believe that they're, they're a far more appealing bunch than, let's say, the effeminate orbiters you see on most college campuses, but they don't seem like alphas to me, traditional leaders of men. They don't appear to, look, to be looking out for anybody but themselves and care not for the world at large. How do we fix this? Well, I would like to say first that I agree with everything you say, that the alpha-beta paradigm is, it's understood by the culture now, is pretty stupid. Because, you know, getting sex, being able to get sex from a lot of different women, alpha males of the past were able to do that, but that was not their primary focus, which is what the primary focus of the current consideration, the current definition of what the alpha male is, you know, that's their primary focus. And the current arrangement with regard to what alpha males are, there's no societal benefit. There's no cultural benefit. Okay, you get laid a lot, but what comes of it? It's not like you are, you know, creating families because of it. With respect to certain communities, 
they are, but they are very broken families. They are not families that you would consider culturally viable, families that aren't maintaining or strengthening a culture. So the current definition of what the alpha male is, it's just, oh, I, I get laid every weekend or every other weekend or however I can get laid whenever I want. It's like, okay, great. You're good with women. You have a degree of, you know, social skills. Great. Now what? Once you ask that question, you kind of hit a dead end with these people with regard to whatever purpose they they have to society. And the purpose they have is none. They're, they're basically one step above chronic masturbators. But these guys you hang out with, these guys you lift with, they seem to be people who benefit and enjoy the current situation of these very basic input-output relationships. Because I don't care who you are, roughly what you offer is roughly what you're going to get. I'm sure all of these guys are on Tinder and, you know, whatever dating site and all of these girls are really offering is, you know, dinner, dancing and sex. And, you know, they're perfectly willing to provide that because, like I said on previous shows, most people are very simple. They are very basic. They think that coming is the greatest joy that there ever is. And that's all they pursue and they will pursue it to extreme lengths. And as for who's to blame men or women in this whole thing, I really don't know. I really don't know. But what I do know is this. If we had a culture that wasn't so simple and stupid and meaningless, there would be a lot more men willing to do something to maintain it. And once upon a time, marriage was the, for lack of a better word, easiest way to make a contribution to it. Because the urge to ejaculate in a man is very strong, and to do it repeatedly uh, on a a regular basis. So society said, okay, you could do this, but you got to get married first. And here's the incentive to get married, whatever that incentive may be. But you don't really have any incentive for marriage anymore. If you had a less stupid, less simple, less meaningless culture... I think you would see more men willing to make a contribution to it. Because what do we have now? What does the U.S. government promote? I think you know what they promote. What does Google promote? What does Amazon promote? The stupidest shit imaginable that nobody, nobody in their right mind would die for. That nobody in their right mind would get their legs blown off for. They wouldn't even get their legs blown off for their own company. Who was it? Justine Tunney did a video about how corporations are replacing nation states, which I don't necessarily disagree with, but put it like this. Is anybody going to die for their company? If ISIS decides we're going to take over Google headquarters, you think that the Google CEO is going to put his ass on the line to protect Google headquarters? Fuck no. And this is the reason why or why I suspect that all these companies want human life to be digitized and uploaded into a computer where all life takes place within the machine instead of, you know, out here on Earth. Cowardice is what motivates these people, and it's pathetic. I don't know how to fix it. I really don't. I don't know who's to blame or how to fix it. I mean, I know what would fix it, Having a better culture, having a more worthy, noble culture, one that is founded on something, one that bases itself on something other than money and fucking. But how we get there, your guess is as good as mine. God, I'm only, I'm 54 minutes in and I've only answered three emails and I took a week off, which is why you see the uh, Ask FM URL on the title card because... You know, they have a character limit on there. And here's where I will divulge a little bit of information. I only check my email like once a week or two times a week if I have to if I have to spread the recording out over a period of two days. Because once I open emails, they get marked as read and then I won't be able to get back to them because in my mind, I'll think like, oh, I already answered them. So trust me, it's a lot better this way. 
you know, opening these emails as I record the show. But this email is from Charlie. Love your content. Thought I'd share this with you because I found it just bizarrely accurate, even though it's more than 100 years old. I've recently been listening to an audiobook version of Dostoevsky's The Idiot and found this one extended conversation about liberalism that I thought would be really interesting to you. According to Wikipedia, his overall political views were very similar, in my opinion, to what yours seemed to be. So keep that in mind when reading the passage. Actually, it's probably worth reading at least the belief section of his wiki page because the guy seems to have seen the shit that's happening today from so far off that it's amazing. Anyway, here's the chapter. If you have the time to read it, pretty much everything after this paragraph would interest you. I will read this, but um, I won't read it right now as I'm recording because I don't know how long it'll last. But um, yeah, um, people have recommended me Dostoevsky before and... Um, I am not very well versed in literature, I am ashamed to admit, but yeah, I think the only the only guy that I've read extensively is Bukowski, and I really enjoyed Post Office a lot, and um, the documentary, The Bukowski Tapes, which is excellent, I recommend everybody checks that out. But yeah, I do have a blind spot when it comes to uh, older literature, uh, like Dostoevsky, it's just everything that... I was ever made to read in, you know, school. It's all leftist communist shit, so I'm just like, well, why why bother with literature? So little did I know that there is a whole world of it that is enjoyable. So but thank you, I have the link you sent me booked marks bookmarked. So I will check it out after I'm done recording. Alright, let's get to the older emails. Because um, I just realized that I have a whole second page of them. Silly me. Anyway, this is from Anthony. Did you watch the S SJWFB live stream? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? I'm watching it right now and it's pretty cringeworthy. It's exactly what I expected from these pseudo-intellectual idiots. It reminded me of your recent video where these people circle jerk about how they aren't extremist. I really hope you do it at Tumblrista's video or Tumblrista's raw segment taking the piss out of them. I don't know what this is, but, um, and if you could send me a link if it's still out there somewhere, send me a description of what went down, because I, I don't know what this is, I'm not familiar with this, and this, this email was sent, um, it was sent a couple weeks ago, and I haven't gotten to it, so, yeah, um, just send me an email telling me, uh, what exactly it is, because it seems like something that I could stomach, but yeah, most people do agree with what SJW say, they just don't like how they go about telling people you know their whatever their message might be so it, it's very annoying this is from uh maple maple motherland hey common filth great show you're running thanks for getting these correct albeit unpopular views out there my question to you is with the western world being in the state have you yourself considered and what are your thoughts on running away by this i mean anything from going in the woods and running a homestead to getting a plot of land on Pitcairn Island in the middle of the Pacific, where surrounded by few others and cut off from most pop culture. One can escape the degeneracy which plagues us, as well as do something more productive with their hands. There's a song by the Kinks called Ape, Ape Man, which is really good, and I've, I've had that sort of feeling at times. It's just, I didn't have an upbringing where I was taught to, you know, do things with my hands. I was always more pushed in a cerebral direction by virtue of, you know, who I seem to be as a child. And, you know, maybe I am a more cerebral type and that's all fine and well. And, you know, if I would have joined the military, I probably would have learned more of these survival things because, you know, my dad was in, in the military and, you know, during his basic training, he had to go out in the woods and, you know, eat bugs and, you know, do whatever it was to survive for however many days out in the wilderness. So I certainly could have taken the same path, but I had a brain injury um, pretty early on in my childhood that left me epileptic. So, you know, I wouldn't be able to get medical clearance or so I'm told. But yeah, I just, I, even if I wanted to start a life basically starting from scratch with at regard to everything, I wouldn't know where to start. I don't have the skills to do so. I admit it. I'm weak. I'm dependent on modernity and all of its trappings. 
And pop culture definitely is a uh, a poisonous and annoying thing, but I don't know. I actually don't consume that much pop culture. I don't expose myself to it that much, and um, I feel bad for people who do because the values promoted in it are just are terrible. But the closest thing that I would do to what is in your email is move to Belize, which... You know, it's probably not that big of a deal, but, you know, they speak English there, so... I'm just ill-equipped to say, fuck civilization, I'm gonna go... I'm gonna go live amongst nature, because I just... I, again, I would not know where to start. Next up, please keep me anonymous. First off, thanks for the great podcasts and hilarious shows. Keep up the good work, I'm planning on bull- buying both the Tumblr's to Zara volumes soon. Well, thank you very much. Just two questions for you. You've talked about atheism before, but I'd like you to elaborate or reiterate if it's truly compatible with a worldview similar to yours, or is God required in order to have a, to truly have a functional traditional lifestyle? I've asked because I've tried and simply can't return to the Christian faith. I respect it and its accomplishments, however. Secondly, a question about music. I passively enjoy genres like disco, jazz, and swing, which I fully acknowledge were surrounded by degenerate cultures when they were at their peak of popularity, especially disco. In the modern day, is it possible to separate the music from the people who enjoyed it and created it in the past? Thanks again for all the good work, and I can assure you your words aren't missing the ears of millennials, as I've introduced your work to a few of my friends, all around 18 and 17 years old. Well, thank you very much. I do think that people can have values like dignity, loyalty, and self-respect without any religious foundation. It's just, for most people, dignity, loyalty, and self-respect cannot be appreciated and enjoyed on their own merits. They need to serve some higher purpose, which is where God comes in. And that is, that's fine, because I believe in God. But it is difficult to sell loyalty, dignity, self-respect to your average 90 IQ person who thinks that jizzing is the greatest thing in the world because, you know, it's like, oh, what? Ah, it makes me feel good. Oh, therefore it's good. Duh, duh, duh. It's difficult to sell these ideas without a atheistic foundation. A theistic not foundation, not an atheistic foundation. It's difficult to get across in words, but you get what I'm saying. It's like, people are not fit to be their own gods. When people are their own gods, what happens? You get people like the fucking amazing atheist making internet videos of himself pouring hot oil on his penis. So, um, I think that people who don't believe in God can have um, similar traditional values. It's just, it's not ideal because not everybody is smart enough to limit themselves. And that's ultimately what God does. God serves as a limitation. It sets boundaries. God sets boundaries. But I've answered a similar question um, with regard to the music thing before. I don't worry too much about, you know, the kind of music that you like, because really, if you listen to something, it's not like you listen to it because it's like, oh yeah, I like, I like drugs. This makes me want to do drugs. No, you, you, you listen to it. You enjoy it because there's something aesthetically pleasing about it. I don't know why most people who make their money, who make a lot of money in entertainment, end up engaging in all sorts of degenerate behavior. A lot of people who make a lot of money in the entertainment business, they end up becoming just terrible people. They end up becoming drug addicts, sex addicts, whatever. And I don't know why that is. But if you listen to something, I don't know, who who beat the shit out of Tina Turner, Ike Turner, you know, or Chuck Berry, who filmed girls peeing in a bathroom that he owned, you know, it's like you listen to a Chuck Berry song, you don't think of that. So don't worry too much about the things you enjoy. It's just, you know, it's something that pleases you for whatever reason. And the only thing that I would say is, like, don't create an identity out of, you know, being a fan of something because, you know, Tumblr is full of examples of how that can go horribly wrong. But thank you for the question. And this next question comes from Brandon. A group and I saw Tomorrowland and walked out about 30 minutes in. They wanted to leave because it blew ass dirt, but for me it had parts that were way worse. 
The main character was the typical male protagonist. Super into tech, drives a Kawasaki, takes matters into his own hands, gets in trouble with the police, so on. Except it's not a male. It's a teenage girl. Basically a guy with boobs. Riders had to get that female empowerment quota filled. I don't know if she does anything really feminine in the whole movie, but for 30 minutes, that was it. There's a scene where she explores this Tomorrowland utopia, and when she gets there, she's in a promenade where a trio of boys are playing on jetpacks. One of them crashes, and the other two laugh and help him up. One of the kids is black, the other is white, and I'm thinking to myself, don't even. They help him up, and ding, he's Hispanic, so I'm already getting what this movie's trying to do. The rest is a bar fest, so I won't go into it. I don't know how long Disney's been pushing this social slime, but the fact that this is a family movie is scary. I mean... Am I overreacting? I don't really know how to forge this into a question, but maybe you could lend me some of your thoughts on this stuff. My dudes argue this stuff isn't catching on in the mainstream, and to not worry, but when Disney holds you down by the neck and crams its social justice dildo down your throat, I can't help but worry. At least we know our $15 went to George Clooney's Touch of Grey Fund. The diversity stuff isn't too surprising, you know, these mixed groups of of kids of different races, you know, they've been, that's pretty much in every commercial. So honestly, it's not that triggering to me because, you know, I'm sure there's some market research that says, look, if we include the diversity in it, people will like it more and it'll make us this X amount of money and, you know, fine. Okay. I get it. Whatever. I don't think it's terribly damaging or, or unrealistic that you show kids of different races playing with each other i mean if they were like engaged in a nambla gay orgy that would be a different thing but but yeah the whole oh i'm a girl but i like boy things thing that's what's more bothersome to me because it makes inherently feminine things look inferior like nurturing for your loved ones being a mother whatever and maybe the intentions are are sinister by the powers that be in hollywood that make these sort of movies but Really, most people, most of the people that work in television and film are women. And, you know, most of these consultants who are like, we need a tough girl because we need to end stereotypes. And stereotypes are always wrong. This is what they think. This is as thoroughly as they think about it. Not thinking to themselves, A, is this inversion of a stereotype realistic? And B... Would a civilization be able to survive if these things were inverted, if gendered roles were opposite? And the answer is no. You really think a roving gang of tough girls could take down ISIS? Give me a fucking break. They'd all sit around in a circle saying, how do we humanely deal with these people? I don't know how long ago I mentioned this, but look at the Ghostbusters remake or the sequel or whatever the fuck it is. How it's all women. Do you know of any women in real life that would fuck off their easy government job to put their asses on the line to make their own business? Fuck no, they wouldn't. That's why it's stupid. It's not stupid for the original Ghostbusters to be men because all the time you hear stories about guys who give up their high-paying jobs to take a pay cut so that they can do their own thing. They can be their own boss. Stefan Molyneux being an example of this. How he talked about, yeah, I used to be this real high-paying software executive, high-paid software executive, and I quit that job so I could do podcasts. Women are inherently risk-averse because they have less egg to spare. But these unrealistic portrayals, you know, if they have sinister purposes, which, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they did, but... These portrayals just come out of a place where people really don't understand human nature. They don't understand why men do what they do or why women do what they do. Because they view everyone as just all anybody does is consume. There's, there are no roles to be played. There's just holes to be filled with paused loads. Okay, next question. I'm a big fan of the show. I wait around every week for your updates, refreshing my subscription tab. Anyway, my question is, what do you think about traditionalist neo-pagans? I am a Catholic, and I used to spend a lot of time with a guy who identified with neo-paganism. A lot of their ideals I found to be interesting. He put a lot of emphasis on both physical and mental strength, which I think is important for the current cultural climate. 
Personally, though, I think that neo-paganism is merely another symptom of cultural Marxism. When you look at the average person who calls themselves heathen, their views on society don't often differ from the hedonistic tendencies of common people and are coupled with an uninformed critique of Christianity that amounts to not much more than OMG, weak religion, they oppressed and killed us, with none of the self-awareness to understand that they don't come from a pagan culture. The guy I mentioned earlier uses his Facebook as a platform to voice a lot of his frankly retarded opinions laced with stupid rightist buzzwords, both common and invented. Note I am right wing, but buzzwords add nothing to the conversation. I'd rather keep this anonymous and not go into too much detail, but do you have any experience with these kinds of people? Regards, keep what keep doing what you're doing. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the question, and I'll start off by saying that no, I really don't have any experience with uh, those who um, identify as pagan. But subscribing to these dead religions, to me, just seems like willful alienation. And it comes out of a desire or some perceived need to be unique and separate from everyone else when... It's really not beneficial to do that. There was a review on Soiled Cinema recently, and I, I can't remember the exact quote or, or what movie it was from, but the author of the, of the review said that dead religions are dead for a reason, and it's pretty pathetic that these neo... He didn't use pagans, but, you know, like these neo-Odinist types going on the internet and making fun of Christians is not really a, it's not a way to go. Blah, 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 it's my slave morality, blah, 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 ha, ha, you worship a dead kike on a stick, you know, things like that. But again, I don't have any experience with people who are pagans or neo-pagans or whatever, because, I mean, I'm sure I've met a few and I didn't know it, but the personality type you're describing is just not something I want to associate myself with. It's not some, these kinds of people are not people I would like to be friends with. So sorry that you know one of these sorts of insufferable people and I hope it's not too traumatizing for you. And if my email will load, I can get to the next questions. All right. Next from, uh, Mr. Carducci. I find your use of the term Golden Retriever Girls hilarious. It perfectly matches the attitude and appearance of a certain group of women in America. However, I never heard it used anywhere but on your podcast. What is its origin? It's a million do from a million dollar extreme video where he's going through these short videos of these people who work in advertising, talking about what inspires them. And he comes across this one video of this one girl who he calls... <laughs> he calls her a golden retriever, but dumber, and that's where I got the term. So, credit to the great Sam Hyde for inventing it. This next one is from Han. A bit of a simple question this time, but I think on a Return of Kings article, someone said something to the effect of, those who produce the least protest the most. What are your feelings on such a statement? I would like to believe it holds true with people today in almost every aspect. Thank you, as always. Yeah, because if you're a creator, you have some sort of output, and some sort of objective output, you realize how hard that is. You realize what goes into it. All of the pain-in-the-ass aspects of what goes into creating anything, what goes into work. And those who don't work those who don't create anything, those that aren't exhausted at the end of the day, they think that the things they consume, they just happen. They they come out of thin air. And they might say like, oh, it takes a lot of hard work, but they really don't know what that means. So they think they're entitled. Entitled to a living wage or, you know, higher minimum wage, doing their stupid nonsense job. They think that they should deserve to have you know, a mortgage and, you know, yearly vacations off of whatever the hell they do. No one asks themselves, is what I do essential to keeping the machine that is civilization running? Is what I do so vitally important that I deserve all this money to do what I do? 
Nobody asks themselves this question. Nobody asks themselves, this stupid job I'm working that I'm making barely above minimum wage at, if this job were to go away, would society be any worse off because of it? Nobody understands that if you want to make more money, you have to make yourself essential to somebody. It's like you think the people who, you know, make six-figure incomes are just given that because somebody likes them? No. Somebody is giving them that amount of money because they're making or saving somebody way more than that amount of money. It's a very simple idea, one that doesn't seem to be taught. I had to figure that out on my own. Nobody, no, no teacher I had ever talked about working, labor, making money in this respect. Not even my parents told me about this. Maybe people in the past just accepted this as a given and now people don't because the shared assumptions are just, they're going away. They are no longer. Next up. In the past, I've asked a few anonymous questions, and I would like to thank you for answering them and all you do to keep in touch with your listeners. Now I need more than the limited word count that is available on Ask FM for your CF wisdom. And I also think that if there are other people that are having the same situation out there, your advice could help. Recently, my lifelong best friend came to me with a problem he and his family have never faced. His older sister has come out privately to them about feeling like she is a man trapped in a woman's body. She says that she's a transgender and is feeling strong about an actual transformation. I'm deeply concerned on how she came to this statement. She was brought up by a strong, loving Christian family with close Christian friends and homeschooled. This is not the typical situation where people who struggle with the issue usually start. I've repeated some of the things that you've discussed regarding the whole transgender issue, but I could use some more information on this subject. If you could give some advice on how to handle, talk to, and basically deal with this situation, it would be greatly appreciated. We have never had to talk about this before, and I'm afraid it could be very uncomfortable and hurt our friendship. Here's some basic info. She's mostly on the internet, which really lacks any moral compass. She's into the anime culture. She just graduated high school. She's still living at home. In the past, she liked boys. Recently, she has been battling Crohn's disease. I feel like her coming out like this is a product of wanting to feel in control of something. Besides her disease, she already has little control on where to go for college, what job to pursue, where to live, and what is her purpose. I believe that controlling things like her gender or sexual preferences gives her that feeling that she has some control. Do you believe this is typical in most transgenders? Do you believe the internet can be a big factor. So co to conclude, I hope you can help me in this situation and provide some advice in communicating effectively with my best friend and his sister. Really, any feedback would be appreciated. I think you might be onto something um, with regard to why this is happening and having a disease and being in isolation for an extended period of time can lead people to have some weird thoughts about what's going on with them. And I think that focusing on this girl's pre-existing disease would go a long way in, in helping her to realize this thing you want to do to your body, it will not help you fight this disease in any way. And maybe the medications she's taking to alleviate the symptoms of this disease the medication is causing her to have these crazy ideas about herself. I understand why she's feeling depressed like this, but somebody has to let her know in the most loving way possible that this is a temporary thing, that these low points are a temporary thing, and that her wanting to become a man is just a function of her being depressed and needing something to end this situation that she's in. But her self-diagnosis is completely false. It's not going to do her any good. In fact, it will do her less than good. Because her problem isn't that, oh, I'm trapped in a woman's body. No, her problem is that she has a disease. She's living in relative isolation. And she's depressed. And 
making this decision to become the opposite gender or opposite yeah opposite gender because it's an identity thing we really need to end this gender thing and just go back to sex because despite the name sex change you really cannot change your biological sex and i know i talk about this website a lot it's called sexchangeregret.com go to sexchangeregret.com and you'll see that it's a statistically fatal or severely damaging thing no good comes from it i will read a little bit from this website young or old early in transition or years later changing genders ends in regret and often in a total nightmare I realize different people will draw different conclusions about the people who make the difficult decision to go back. I just feel you should see the stories of those who regret their transition. Chelsea, going back to after seven years. Seven years ago, Matthew, a male drag queen, became Chelsea. Now Chelsea wants to become Matthew again. In, an, in the article published October 1st, 2014, Chelsea says, I have always longed to be a woman, but no amount of surgery can give me an actual female body, and I feel like I am living a lie. It is exhausting putting on makeup and wearing heels all the time. Even then, I don't feel I look like a proper woman. I suffered from depression and anxiety as a, re as a result of the hormones, too. I have realized it would be easier to stop fighting the way I look naturally and accept that I was born a man physically. Britain's youngest sex swapped patient to detransition. After all the favorable publicity in the U.S. about children needing sex change treatment, it's refreshing to read that it is not happily ever after. This young person made the decision at age 16 to 17 to start the transition and now regrets it only one year later. She has canceled the operation scheduled for January and halted hormone treatments. She or he confirms the point I made in my book Paper Genders. The brain hasn't matured enough to make this decision until the person reaches their mid-twenties. So why would we encourage any child to undergo treatments with such long-term consequences? Following is an excerpt from the article, uh, October 29, 2012. Although Miss Cooper underwent a thorough psychological assessment and counseling at Hull Royal Infirmary prior to starting her sex-change therapy, she has suffered such torment living as a woman that she has tried to commit suicide twice. She told the Sunday Mirror, the hormones have made me feel up and down. One minute I feel moody and the next minute I feel really happy. The night I tried to slash my wrist, I downed a bottle of Jack Daniels and just thought about how alone I am and how my decision has alienated my family and how, uh, how I will have to become a boy again to resolve it. So um, there are people out there who provide resources on what it's really like. What happens when the daytime TV crews leave and... You're still alone. You're still miserable. And I'm not saying that we need to treat these people abusively. We need to do the opposite. These people need love in their lives. And what people are doing now, what the common culture thinks we need to do, is not love at all. Love is not enabling damaging behaviors. People think that not judging, leaving people to their own devices, is a loving act when that is the most hateful thing that you could ever do to anybody because they do not know what they are doing. People have no idea what they're doing. And people need to realize this, especially those who think that they're born in the wrong body. So, sexchangeregret.com tells the other side of the story quite well. This one is from John. Hey CF, love your content. I was wondering if you plan on making any content for purchase besides Tumblrista's videos. I want to support you in some way, but to tell you the truth, I don't always have the constitution to withstand the depths of degeneracy new trading card game idea that you regularly dive into, somehow unscathed. Do you plan on making any content that's a little bit, I don't know, easier to stomach? Well, I do have a Common Filth Radio, the best of 2014, and... If you've already bought that, thanks a lot, and that's about the only thing that um, I have an idea for right now that's a concrete thing that I release the best of Common Filth Radios, uh, the, the compilations of those once a year, because any more frequently than once a year, I think it would be too much. I mean, there are some things exclusive to that collection that it, that's not on the YouTube channel, but 
most of it is just highlights what I think are the best parts from, from each episode that I've done. I do have one idea that's in its very, very, very early stages that would not be released to Bandcamp, but it would be uh, available for purchase elsewhere. But I don't want to talk about it because if I talk about it, it's not going to happen. I just, that's just how it works for me. I talk about something that I'd like to do and it just never happens. So I, I tend to keep quiet about it. So if I make any progress, any meaningful progress on this very, very early idea that I have, then I'll, I'll tell you. But I will definitely work on, on some other ideas or at least try to think of some because, yeah, if I'm going to charge uh, somebody for something, I want them to get their money's worth out of it. It's just I don't have any ideas right now that would be worthy of charging Next from Jeff, I can tell from time to time that doing the show does get you down given the depths of the depravity out there, but I do want to thank you. Thank you for exposing these sins as they are. It is confronting work, but it is a necessary one. These depravities are to be despised and shown to be despised. It does help me keep focus on what to avoid and realize how slippery the slope is, how toxic and ultimately destructive tolerance is. When we stop recognizing the worth of each individual person, including ourselves, we invite these monstrous behaviors in. We stop seeing men and women as someone else's spouse and see them as a tool to be used for our own gratification. Again, it all distills down to do unto others, doesn't it? The Lord has many lessons for this age, but so many are blind to the pain they inflict and are deaf to the cries of those who leave suffering. Like the U.S., Australia is being morally drowned in the wake of Ireland's homosexual marriage bill. Every politician here seems to be hopping on the bandwagon. No one wants to recognize how soul-destroying these relationships are. Most people have bought into the sitcom fairy tale of homosexuality. The church and the rest of society will be gathering up the shattered pieces of people's lives for many, many generations from all of this, save for his return. Lord, I hope it is soon. Just wanted to ask, how do you spiritually recharge from all of that? Do you have a routine devotion you do to keep you on track and bounce back from all of the pain this world throws at you? Are you regular with your prayer, or do you need to find other ways to give praise? Or are you sneaking in some service work to the needy to get your mind off of things? Every man is different when it comes to his personal personal relationship with God and his son. When I was a lot younger, I loved to read through some Proverbs before hitting the sack, but of late I have been copying out a psalm a day by hand. I have atrocious handwriting, so I have the dual benefits of practicing the dying art of cursive handwriting and giving praise. I am struck by David's completely honest relationship with God, how he relies on him and the depth of his faith. David was no panty waste. He was a strong warrior and king, It's still even he had enough meekness to come to the Lord. Still get a chill now and then when I notice a foretelling of the New Testament in the Psalms. God is just that good. I'm curious to hear about how you find that inner strength to keep on fighting the battles against this world. Keep on doing the good work you've been called to do. Thank you very much for this email. I use a couple of things to cope with the horrors of life on Earth, and um, one of them actually is this show, despite the content that I deal with, and it is very upsetting content um, a lot of the time, but... I get emails from people all the time and messages from people all the time that thank me for what I do, because I don't like to fool myself that I am changing minds, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm convincing people of certain things. I think that I'm organizing people who come from a similar place, who have a, a similar mindset. So getting gratitude from people whose opinions I would value, that means a lot to me. That keeps me going. I also like to um, remind myself that times were more troubled, or at least as troubled as the ones we're living through now, and life still went on. And a lot of those times are portrayed in the Holy Bible. And the main difference between then and now is that we have the internet where all of this evil is documented in great detail, and you can access it within a ma matter of seconds, the, the information. But it takes a lot of effort to put these things into perspective and realize that we aren't the only people that have lived through a lot of evil. And yeah, just 
just mainly allowing myself to be receptive to the gratitude that people express to me, and I'm always appreciative to hear that. But I think that writing psalms out by hand and in cursive is a is a neat idea because cursive. It, I remember I learned it when I was in in grade school, and I mean I couldn't really read other people's cursive too well, but it still always looked nice, and people just are losing sense of that. It's just a sense of basic beauty that is that is not that difficult to achieve. All you need to do is know what steps to take. There are great buildings all around the world that exist for, that have existed for so many decades, so many centuries, just for the fact that they're beautiful. These buildings have been around during world wars, natural disasters, whatever. They stay because there is beauty about them. There is something very impressive about them. And I think that form and function and you know, practicality is important, but nobody preserves things for that purpose. People preserve things because they are beautiful. Beauty will save the world. When you think of something beautiful, you don't think of a toilet, unlike what they teach you in art school. Worthless. Okay, next. I sent you a Ask FM question two months or so ago about my little sister being full-on SJW feminist bitch. I stuck with her like you suggested, and she seems to have become less fucked in the head. Either it's because she's realized the kind of life social justice zealously doesn't go anywhere as she gets closer to graduating from college herself, or maybe my constant rebuttal of her stupid arguments has gotten through to her. She's still a feminist bitch, but at least she checks her facts now before spewing her red-hot bullshit at me. I can respect that to an extent. Keep doing God's work, my friend. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I really think that far-left whining and and feminist propaganda and whining about oppression and injustice, especially when it comes from women, is just a cry for attention or a means by which to gain approval from some terrible people. I don't know. Maybe it's just a giant shit test. I I mean, there are various theories about it, but usually people with, um, I mean, women with husbands or, you know, long a fiancé or a long-term boyfriend, they usually don't go on about this too much. And if these sorts of women do go on about this stuff and they do have a man in their life, they're, the man is probably henpecked and probably have they probably have a bigger vagina than they do. So, but I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for the email. Next, it's Chippa. Thanks for responding to my email on your show a couple weeks ago. First question is, how do you suppose one would find a woman who isn't a complete degenerate without having to buy a Camaro, park it outside, common hangouts for high schoolers at noon, and try to convert a girl out of degeneracy while she's still young and impressionable? I've never met a woman in my life who wasn't either a whore or a liberal. I don't have any idea where I can meet any. My initial thought was to join a church, but most of the women I knew growing up were whores who called themselves Christians because they went to these youth group nightclub things that were hosted by a church, but were a place for teenagers to get wasted and grind their genitals on each other in public with loud music. These same people now occupy the churches in my community, and it seems hopeless to find a decent conservative woman. Well, earlier in the show, we found out that there's are there at least two of them. Uh, second, when I was in the 8th grade in my language arts class, I had a teacher that nearly every guy in the class had a crush on. One day near the end of the year, we had a creative writing assignment. We were to write a story about our ideal summer. Most in the class wrote about getting their first job, meeting a girl, or going on vacation. I wrote about me standing up to my mother's friend Lamar, who had been abusing her. Every week I'd come home from my school and my mother would rush to meet me. Her clothes poorly put on with shirts backwards, buttons not done up properly, Pants unzipped, her hair in a mess, and bruises on her neck. I'd ask her what happened, and she'd tell me, Chippa, don't be a noisy, nosy Nathan, and do your homework. Lamar and you were just wrestling, is all. I knew they weren't just wrestling because Lamar would never have any bruises on him. In my story, I threw hot engine oil on Lamar's chest and kicked him out of my house so my mother and me could enjoy our summer together. I was the last to hand in my story, so the teacher was reading it when the bell rang. She told me to stay while everyone was leaving. She said to me, Chippa, you got a big... Fucking Pekka. And then she sat on it with her asshole. That's how bad she wanted it. I, I made her come so... Oh boy, I've been hoodwinked. 
I made her come so bad. She said, Chippa, keep your money. Come back later. And I said, no, nah, I got to go. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> well, you say that the women that you know are either whores or liberals. Well, if a girl is a liberal but not a whore, she probably just accepts like, oh, it feels good. People are equal. That's nice. And, it, you know, gives her the warm fuzzies and that's what's popular to believe in. She probably doesn't have that much conviction driving those opinions, so go after the liberal chicks if they aren't whores themselves, because they will eventually come around to see things your way. Once you remove the incentive for her to be liberal, she will most likely stop being liberal and find some way to rationalize seeing things your way. So, Alright, next up from mine. Hello once again, CF. I'm back to ask you with my thoughts and questions. First off, loved last episode. Part about drilling holes in skulls was wonderful. A great thing to listen to when you're hungry, because it will put you off from your, put it will put you off your appetite pretty quick. So thanks for that. Prevented me from eating some junk food, which is a good thing. Also, can I say I absolutely loved your art piece you did in Tumblr East's episode 22. It was so inspiring and thought provoking, especially the symbolism of the toilet truly encapsulated the imagery of the rich, diverse, multicultural society we live in today. Forget the Mona Lisa or that other oppressive patriarchal art. We need artworks like yours in museums. Less pastel, more period blood, I say. Or more Tropicana fruit juice, which is what I used. I might also add that I remember a while back you talked about the anti-SJW crowd and how they are basically SJWs who just don't have Tumblr accounts or 500 cats. Well, today I saw this. And to be honest, I can perfectly see what you mean now. Yes, good goy, we are oppressed. We're not your American sluts. They just pretend to be oppressed. Now share our post where you're being anti-Semitic. And this links to a Facebook post, which I will click on now. And uh, just one question this week. What happened to you reading Tumblr hashtag? I enjoyed those a lot. Thanks for doing what you do as always, and I look forward to the next episode. Well, I mean, if if you want me to do them, I kind of did it at the beginning of the episode where I was looking at old screenshots, but yeah, I could look at some Tumblr hashtags. I just need some suggestions because I only have so much capacity with regard to imagination, seeing things through the perspective of crazy people. So let's take a look at this Facebook post that I will read. Not a feminazi cringe, but I think it deserves a shout out. This is a slut walk in Jerusalem. You should give this guy a like. His photography is amazing. A Jewish slut walk. I'm sure our, our uh, one or two Jewish listeners will really appreciate that. Oi vey, I thought this was for Goyim only. And the people in the comments are very triggering. What's also cool is that they're not naked. None of them are naked. This is how it should be done. Explain what... Okay. This is real fucking feminism. Kill me. This... Uh, these are people that would just look at you funny if you said, you know, women in the workplace just decreases wages by half. These sorts of good goy anti-SJWs would probably tell you that you're bigoted for thinking that only landowners should be allowed to vote because, you know, people who um, whose only concern in public affairs is what they can leech off of it. Yeah, those people should vote. Those people should have a say in how their fellow man's life is lived. It is nauseating. All right, this is from R. Uh, I believe you are the voice of Mr. Plinkett, unless you have an uncanny ability to mimic others. But if this is true, then wouldn't you also be Mike Stockla... Stockla... Ta I can't pronounce names today. Stocklasa from Red Letter Media fame. And if so, is this CF project an underground extension of the stuff you've been doing on Red Letter? I don't see too many connections between the two, apart from the dark humor you personally apply. Anyway, I won't tell anyone if you are indeed Plinket in disguise. And that was sent from the Bandcamp page. Um, no, I am not Mike from Red Letter Media. I've said on previous episodes that I think those guys are pretty stupid. They should just... And no, it's not because they didn't like a movie that I liked or like a liked a movie that I didn't like. I think that's stupid to dislike somebody on that basis. They have really dumb opinions and they force them into where they don't belong. So that's why I dislike what they do. 
This is from Pontius. Big fan of your show here. Been an avid follower of this show since episode one aired last year. Since then, I haven't had a question to ask you until today. My question is, how do you feel about the overall decline of Christianity over the course of 150 years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? Is the, mo- is the overall decline of the West linked to the rejection of Christ by modern intellectuals and the creation of cultural Christianity? Anyway, thank you for doing what you do and keep up the good work. I couldn't say anything about Christianity's decline that I can't say about anything else. I think that Christi- Christians and Christianity have fallen prey to the exact same things that everything else has, Christian or not Christian. And certainly industrialization has made it more possible for people to lead atomized, very individualistic lives where people who live around other people, rely on each other, have shared experiences shared assumptions, shared views, that that opens up your heart to God. That tells you being around your fellow man who has your back, has the same interests as you, that increases your connection to God, I believe. There's probably a better way to articulate that, but that's the best that I can summon um, at this time. But And um, a, another function of industrialization is that People can avoid consequences for their bad behavior. Certain diseases can be mitigated or removed. And it's as if the the consequences never really existed. Because there's incentive, there's a profit incentive to keep certain people alive that have certain diseases. I know I've been, you know, hammering on the bug chasing thing a lot. And a lot of people say, well, these people are just killing themselves off. We should let them do this. This is a good thing. On the other hand, the pharmaceutical companies have a reason to keep these people alive. Despite the fact that they offer nothing to anybody. Other than, you know, taxpayer subsidized AIDS cocktails. Which the companies are more than happy to receive because, hey, free money. Let's keep these degenerates alive so we can have money. So, yeah, avoiding consequences for behavior, that also turns the heart away from God. This one is from Anonymous. Hello, first of all, I enjoy your show and I'm grateful to you for the time you spend producing it. I have three kids that I homeschool. They're all still pretty young. I'm also a Christian. Like most good parents do, I worry constantly about the world I brought them into. I lay awake most nights wondering how to best equip them as to not be sucked into the black hole of relativism and gender fluidity. I am interested in how your parents raised you. You said you come from a Christian family, but not an overly strict one. How did they handle discipline? Was it ever physical, and if so, how? My kids are not beaten, but there are rare occasions when I feel I have no other options aside from light physical force. I am never sure if this is the right choice because I always feel bad. Like I took the lazy way out and there are better and more creative ways to discipline. I also choose to shelter my children from a lot of modern culture. Of course, there's always a question how much sheltering is too much. I know you can't give me definitive answers. I'm mostly curious about how you're raised since you seem to have a firm grasp on truth. Thanks for your time and I look forward to more common filth shows. There has been some research um, that, that has been done that indicates that Children whose parents punished them primarily through physical force have a lot of behavioral problems later on in life. And I realize that frustrations can become overwhelming and you do lash out physically. People do lash out physically towards their children. But, and you know, certainly my uh, my parents did that at times, but it definitely was a, a rare occurrence. But the way that they punished me mostly was by taking away privileges, you know, I couldn't go out to play with my friends, I, you know, couldn't watch TV or play video games or go on the computer, you know, things like that. And with other things, I was allowed to watch movies, I was allowed to listen to music and watch TV, but they were always mindful of what what they let me watch or, or listen to. They, they previewed a lot of stuff. I mean, I didn't watch a whole lot of R-rated movies with nudity, so... I mean, that was deprived of me, and it wasn't something that I ever really had the desire to watch anyway, so... So I think that outright sheltering your children from 
stuff that's in modern culture is, I mean, they're going to be deprived of it and then they're going to be introduced to it all at once, once they get some degree of freedom and, you know, they'll, they'll freak out and take it too far. Like all these kids on Tumblr who are obsessed with Sherlock Holmes being a homosexual or whatever. So, just from speaking from my experiences, it's a good idea to um, not let your children get their ideas from mass media and pop culture. But at the same time, you don't want to shut them off completely from it. Because if you were to do that, it'll just give them a pretext for rebellion and fuck you mom fuck you dad and that's not something that that anybody would want but that's all the insight i really have to offer i mean nothing about my childhood stuck struck me as particularly odd but thank you for the email and i hope you and your family are doing well all right let's get through these ask fm questions 4chan or 8chan 8chan how should a decent masculine person dress and appear? Um, I think that you shouldn't wear, like, gimmicky comedic t-shirts. Uh, that's the only thing that I would say um, not to wear. Um, most of my wardrobe is just black shirts because I like to signal to people that I'm, I'm sympathetic to fascism. No, that's not the reason why. Honestly, I've never had too much of an eye for fashion, so I figure just keep it very simple dignified, basic, easy to maintain. So black shirt, jeans, that's that's most of my wardrobe. Will you ever reveal your identity? Yes, eventually. Honestly, I don't think my identity is very important. Shouldn't we encourage Islamic immigrations even more so they can kill feminists, communists, and degenerates? But I repeat myself. And then we can rebuild on whatever's left. Um, no, for the for the reason that people like you and me would likely be collateral damage. It's just a matter of personal safety not wanting to have massive Islamic immigration. Uh, it's not like you'd get the smart, high IQ Muslims who assimilate well. Why do I feel the need to seek approval from others? Is there a way to bypass or resist this? Um, you need to find the sort of personality traits and values that you find important and judge yourself based upon those values and make important the opinion of people who have those values because everyone seeking approval from somebody i think that's a very basic human impulse it's just who you're seeking approval from that's what's important. And um, another thing that's important with regard to not needing the constant approval from others is just growing up and having your own accomplishments and gaining a sense of worth from those accomplishments, independent of the input from anybody else. As in most things, not needing so much approval from people will take time and it will take patience. And once you get your own accomplishments, once you have your own legs to stand on, you will need it less. And when you do seek that approval, it will be from people who truly matter to you. So, thanks for the question. What's your opinion on sex before marriage? Well, if you look at the numbers, those that do abstain from sex before marriage, those marriages end in divorce uh, significantly less than... Uh, marriages where the couple does engage in premarital sex. Most people are stupid. Most people think sex is the greatest thing of all time, and they can't fathom anything greater than that. I know I've said this a lot, but it's true. People aren't very bright. So they think that this tingle, their tingly bits, you know, they're making their bits tingle. That's the greatest thing. Oh my God, I can't fathom anything greater than this. Which is why... Marriage is necessary, and, and premarital sex is considered a sin, for very practical reasons. Once upon a time, this impulse, people knew this impulse to have sex, needed to be redirected. After all, you cannot have children without sex. So, that's why marriage was created. So that this impulse could benefit society in some measurable way. So, very simple things. Very fundamental things people knew a long time ago. 
and now we don't know because we are in the information age and we we know lots of things and we're so tolerant and enlightened and progress what would it take for smart people to have as many kids as the dumb ones um i don't think that's possible because smart people subscribe to a different breeding strategy our selection versus k selection you're not going to get elephants to have a ton of babies and you're not going to get rabbits to stop being rabbits you just cannot change the nature of that kind of thing hello common filth i have a longtime friend who recently has found some bad habits like being gender queer sometimes he dresses like a girl the other times he presents himself in a somewhat normal manner what should i say to him what argument would win him back to the side of reason again i don't know what argument you could possibly come up with but you know yelling at them and and screaming at them will just give them what they want they want to feel oppressed and like a victim because that that is a source of validation for whatever reason i do not know why but it is it, it's there that yearning is there to be a victim to be oppressed because I guess that's all you really learn about in school, all of these poor, oppressed people who were done wrong by Whitey. So, um, again, I you're, you have to just use your intuition with regard to this kind of stuff, and <sighs> maybe point them to sexchangeregret.com if they want to take it that much further. So, um, I, I just, I don't know any of these people. I avoid them. Or not avoid them because there's nothing to avoid. I just don't know any of these kinds of people. What did the Jews do? I don't know. They did a lot. Frankfurt School. And I know Wikipedia calls it a conspiracy theory, but honestly, there is no conspiracy. There is no theory. It just is. Jewish immigration increased once the Third Reich came to power. America's like, oh, come here. Oh, yeah, we'll give you jobs. Because, you know, America's full of... Is it, it, America is the world's genetic toilet. What do you think of Alex Jones? He's a good comedian. Are the Iranians right? Is modern America the great Satan? Yes. What do you think of euthanasia-assisted suicide? I think it's pretty cowardly. Who did 9-11? I did. Do you like the size of your audience now as it is, or do you want it to grow? I always want it to grow. Um, I don't think anybody wants to be living in obscurity um, who, you know, people who produce some kind of entertainment, some, some sort of media content. I, n nobody really wants to exist in obscurity when, when doing stuff like that. Okay, next. I've been going through all your radio shows and love them. I have only watched 41 through 16, though, so sorry if you've already answered this question. I was wondering what version of the Bible you read. Additionally, what do you think about the Gnostic Gospels? Thank you. I don't know too much about the Gnostic Gospels, but um, I go on uh, BibleGateway.com because you're able to uh, bring a drop-down menu. They have a drop-down menu. You click on that, and you can bring down pretty much every translation you can think of. And I typically like to stick to King James, but if there's some words that I don't understand, some phrases I don't understand, I could switch over to the English Standard Version. So those are the two that I switch between, because one is easy, basic to understand, not a whole lot of meaning is lost, at least as far as I can tell. And the other one is very poetic and beautiful, but it can be challenging uh, at times. Next, do you think people are born gay or is it a choice? Just wondering about your thoughts on the subject. Honestly, I would like to first say that I don't think that, oh, born this way is a legitimate argument because, again, the health effects of a homosexual lifestyle are very obvious. They're very damaging. So even if they are born this way, it's still no way to go just by virtue of all of the diseases they are exposing themselves to, all of the social pathologies they are exposing themselves to. And if you really think about the born this way argument, it's really strange and doesn't hold up to scrutiny because we are not born sexually mature. We are not born capable of making babies. We are not born sexual. We exist in heterosexual bodies, but are not, or we are not, yet able to use them when we are born, when we are an infant. 
Now, I'm not saying that there's no genetic basis for homosexuality, but even if it is genetic, it really doesn't manifest itself until several years after birth, around the time of puberty. Because there is some argument that homosexuality is a function of an arrested development or some sort of maldevelopment or some sort of weird, perverted kind of development. There are facial morphological cues that you can look to in homosexuals that you typically don't see in heterosexuals. It's by no means a perfect indicator, but there's a lot of evidence there, even if you just look at it with your own two eyes. So, I mean, the whole born this way argument is pretty stupid. If they were to say developed this way, it might actually have some basis. I think that there is a developmental basis for homosexuality. Alright, next. From the belief that thug is the new nigger to legalizing love to even literally, I've noticed that the meaning of words are being distorted. I know this isn't new, but do you have any thoughts on this phenomena? Are these symptoms of our society's decay, human nature, both or more? Um, I think it's a function of social engineering because language is simply a, a, um, a manifestation of thought, how a large group of people generally think. And certainly, it goes the other way. Words can affect how people think. So if you control the language, you control basically everything. You can't drive on a road if that road doesn't exist. You can't think those thoughts if those thoughts don't exist. And if there are words that whose meaning have been changed, it's like you can't, you can't think those things anymore. Because there's no word for it. And if there is a word, it doesn't mean what it used to. It is a symptom of society's decay, but it's also, it is a function of human nature as well. Because humans are weak, they need to be led in certain ways, and where they're being led is to a place of weakness. Institutionalized weakness. I say that we need to redirect impulses, but, you know, where, where are they being redirected? And how do we re-redirect them? I really don't know. Don't know how. I do not know how to fix things. Do you support hashtag kill all trannies? Um, like I said, no, because it gives them the victimhood they so crave. I think that arguing against transgenderism out of a place of, of love and care would sort of cut that victim mentality un from under them. But at the same time, the heart wants what the heart wants. The brain will do what it will do, and they'll just say that they're disguising oppression with cuddly words and puppies, and they're evil. They're just going to see what they want to see. So, honestly, I would say no, don't kill all trannies, because just for your sake, you don't want the blood to be on your hands. How do we destroy Hollywood? Um, By removing people's free time because Hollywood is an industry. The entertainment industry is an industry based around people's free time. It depends on people having free time. So we as a culture need to find a way to remove people's free time so that they don't orient their lives around watching television, Netflix, going to see movies. That's it. You, you have to remove free time from people. You have to Take time out of their hands, and how you do that, I don't know. So, it really is a sick thing that so much money can be made in these movie studios just because people have nothing to do. Hi, Common Filth, same guy who asked about the video game channel. I have three more questions. One is this edgy... Wait, okay. One is this name edgy enough... Einsatz Gruppen Gaming. Einsatz Gruppen Gaming. Two, will you ask Jim slash Mr. Medoker to do a stream with you? In one of his streams, he agreed to doing a live stream with a right-wing authoritarian. I don't know only one man who is capable of rising to the task. Three, how do I come out to my parents about being a fascist? <laughs> if I were a fag, I would be greeted with, oh, we accept you, same love, sort of response. But if I say that fascism, fascism is a-okay, I think my parents might flip. I don't want to shove it in their faces or anything, but if they find some three edgy five me shit on my phone or computer, I don't want them to feel sad that they raised an evil racist fascist. Forgot what part I'm on. 
Sorry for spamming your shit. Um, I would say that you don't keep your views. Um, don't give your views a name. Don't be like, I'm a this, I'm a that, because it'll just alienate people and make them react in a way that you would not to react, want them to react. And, um, uh, the, the name of your channel, um, I think you should find something a little shorter, but that's just me. That's just my personal preference. And, um, as for doing a stream with, uh, internet aristocrat, um, I don't want to like do a debate because I just don't. I don't prefer the debate format. I prefer the monologue format. I prefer to send monologues back and forth so that people can be heard without interruption. And it's not, it's not based around a gotcha or, ooh, I burned you, which is what debate really is. I mean, whose mind was ever changed by watching a, for example, presidential debate? I'm just not very good at coming up with zingers and making other people look bad. I... I don't like to do it because I don't like having it done to me. Uh, next. Uh, I was I was wondering about your opinion on this page, Lizzie the Lezzy, and pages like it. Basic bitch, same love, blue, 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 we're the same as you. Christians are bigots. Religion is bad because it restricts behavior. That kind of shit. Search for uh, Local M's uh, Lizzie the Lezzy parodies on YouTube. They might still be out there, even though Local M doesn't do videos anymore, at least that I know of. Would you recommend any podcasts to listen to? Common Filth, Daily Show, and White Rabbit aren't enough for me. All the other stuff I found on my own is plebe tier. Uh, Red Ice Radio, they they have a good podcast uh, that they upload to YouTube, and uh, Stefan Molyneux does some good stuff as well, so... Those are the two that I would say, because I think Stefan Molyneux, um, if you're just looking for a lot of content, uh, he he makes a lot every week. So, I mean, I disagree with a lot of what he has to say, but all of his stuff is good, and he's pretty intellectually honest. I put Volume 3, Vine Volume 3, on pull on 4chan. You're doing the Lord's work. Thank you. Well, thank you for promoting my stuff. Have you read the Satanic Bible? It's an interesting read, in my opinion. Uh, no, I haven't, but um, I'll, I'll give it a look. And you're not funny. You shit on me. Who is this? How do I shit on you? Who are you? Or am I just being baited into something? Well, here I am. You baited me.